Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, it's a real privilege to see all of you here and to have David and Sarah, the centerpiece of our evening. Um, David is the current CEO of the Free Market Foundation and has a storied history with the Institute of Race Relations, was executive director of the Center for Risk Analysis, and I think as an extension of his personal values, is a strong advocate for individual liberties and a market-based approach to public policy. Um, David, thank you for taking the time to be with us at the Rand Club this evening for this off the record conversation. Um, so we are convened today under the Chatham House rule, which means you are able to repeat anything you hear tonight, but you cannot indirectly or directly link it to an individual or an institution they may or may not represent. Um, with that, David, take it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Lucky. This might be called Off the Record. As you can see, the cameras are rolling. Um, and that is to record my formal remarks. But once I'm done, we'll turn off the camera and we'll engage in a, in, in a covert, uh, underhanded discussion. Um, <laughs> my talk for tonight is called The Center Cannot Hold. Does South Africa fail if the state fails? Members of the RAND Club, ladies and gentlemen, South Africa is a vast and complicated country. It has a territory of some 1.2 million kilometers, almost uh, twice the size of France, square kilometers that is, and a coastline that stretches some 2,178 kilometers. It is the 24th most populous country on earth, but only the ninth largest population in Africa. Its 60 million people encompass various races, ethnicities, languages, and religions. A relatively young country, the modern South Africa began with the Act of Union in 1910, which was the year that my grandmother was born. Since then, South Africa has been dominated by the politics of the center, with politicians and bureaucrats in Pretoria mostly calling the shots. The history of the 20th century in South Africa was essentially a conflict between two forms of racial nationalism, each competing for control of the apparatus of the state. Since 1994, when the black nationalists replaced the white nationalists, the strength of the state has steadily and mercifully declined. When thinking about the current moment in South Africa, I'm reminded of a poem by William Butler Yeats, The Second Coming, written in the aftermath of World War I and the beginning of the Irish War of Independence in January 1919. It goes like this. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Sound familiar? My argument tonight is that the highly centralized nature of South African politics as we have come to know it is undergoing a fundamental change. What we are experiencing is the end of an era of the country's existing political institutions. The center can no longer hold, and we at the Free Market Foundation believe that it should no longer hold. But the question then becomes, what, if anything, should replace it? What does the collapse of the center of South African politics mean for the future of us South Africans? Things certainly are falling apart, at least for the state. The vertically integrated energy monopoly, ESCOM, can no longer produce enough electricity to power a modern economy, which is rapidly deindustrializing. Manufacturing, a fundamentally energy int intensive activity, has declined as a proportion of national GDP from 21% in 1994 to approximately 12% in 2022. Once a global mining giant, South Africa's ranking in the Fraser Institute of Canada's annual survey of mining companies has placed 57th out of 62 countries in the rankings. This country, this region for which this club is named, was built on the back of mining. And in a few short years, 
policy decisions have put South Africa near to dead last in the world. By contrast, neighboring Botswana ranked 10th out of 62 countries and was number one in Africa. South Africa's once extensive rail network has been stripped bare by criminal syndicates and critical infrastructure is collapsing. On 20th July, just down the road from where we sit today on Bree Street, an explosion from a gas pipeline tore a gaping hole in the street, resulting in 41 injuries. On 31 August, also in the CBD, 77 people tragically lost their lives in a fire that engulfed a hijacked building in Albert Street. The immediate cause of the fire is unknown, but the root cause of this avoidable tragedy was a failure to uphold and protect the private property rights of the original owners. Deliberate policy choices, such as the Prevention of Illegal Eviction Act, or the PIE Act, mean that illegal occupiers of a building are unable to be removed by the owners, who lack the ability to enforce their own private property rights. This means that the rightful owners of the building could do nothing when their property was seized and subsequently rented out by criminal gangs. The poor tenants who the laws were ostensibly designed to protect ended up succumbing to what must have been a horrific death. Meanwhile, on my drive to the office today, I noticed city officials hard at work replacing the road signs of William Nickel Drive to Winnie Mandela Drive. That gives you a sense of where the ANC's current priorities lie. Well, they quite a <laughs> Indeed. The government has effectively run out of money. Ahead of the medium-term budget policy statement on 1 November, the Minister of Finance, Inokorongwana, has told his cabinet colleagues that the current spending pattern is unsustainable. At the last budget speech, South Africa's public finances were in a less compromised position, having recorded a primary surplus, which excludes debt service costs. However, that was off the back of a years-long commodities boom, which led to record profits in the mining industry and which ultimately kept government coffers afloat. Soon after the minister announced his tight budget, the public sector unions negotiated an unbudgeted 7.5% increase. Consider that the minister's call is to trim spending by 25 billion rand. This might seem like a lot, but it pales in comparison to the extra 37 billion that government workers demanded and subsequently received. In a letter to the finance minister, the Free Market Foundation recently suggested that he and the president consider drastically reducing the current cabinet from over 30 ministries to a mere 10 state departments. We aren't holding our breath. Meanwhile, sovereign borrowing, sovereign borrowing continues to climb with the debt to GDP ratio set to reach 72% over the next three years. This borrowing is not being directed towards fixed investments, but rather to fund government consumption, such as civil servant salaries. As free marketeers, we are skeptical of Keynesian fiscal stimulus, but what we are not seeing here is money that is being borrowed to invest in fixed capital formation. The money that is being borrowed is simply being used to keep the state, the state apparatus going. Minister Gonongwana is right. The current trajectory is indeed unsustainable. Another ongoing crisis in South Africa's uh, current political economy is persistently high unemployment. In the second quarter of 2023, the official number of unemployed people stood at 7.9 million. That is 32.6% of the workforce. That's under the narrow definition. But on the expanded definition, which, which includes those no longer actively seeking work, the figures are a lot higher, 11.8 million or 42.1%. Mercifully, many of these people are in fact doing something for money, but they are doing so in an informal, often gray or black market, which the interfering government does not approve of. But flourishing cannot be developed under such circumstances. The law and the economy must work in tandem, not against one another. As we at the FMF noted in a statement in August, South Africa's ongoing joblessness crisis has two causes. The first, and I quote, is the government's overbearing labor regulatory framework, which deters employers from taking a risk on new hires. Trade unionists have successfully lobbied within the Tripartite Alliance 
to protect their unionized jobs at the expense of the poor, who desperately need new work opportunities. The second cause of high unemployment is low economic growth and a lack of competitiveness. Jobs are the byproduct of economic activity. And if South Africa wants more jobs, it needs to make it worthwhile for investors to commit much needed capital to this market and make it easier to do business here. It is not only job seekers who bear the brunt of the state's heavy handed regulation. Thousands of business owners are forced to shut their doors every year and countless number of street vendors are harassed by the police and petty officials on a daily basis. For most South Africans, the state is a threat to them, not a protector of their interests. It is a hindrance at best and a wrecking ball at worst. And here we see a paradox. As the state continues to expand its scope and its authority, it is simultaneously unable to perform its basic functions or even the superfluous new functions it has created for itself. Much is made by mainstream commentators of the need for a developmental state. But as the Institute of Race Relations rightly observed, the state is in fact a detrimental state rather than a developmental one. For many, from many quarters, we hear the refrain that South Africa is actually a failed state. It is perhaps more accurate to describe it as a failing state. After all, failure is a process and not an end point. The process of state failure is necessarily disruptive, especially given how dominant the state has been in every sphere of the economy, both before 1994 and after. However, while the state is failing, it doesn't mean that South Africa or South Africans have to fail. The collapse of the state need not be the existential crisis that it is sometimes made out to be. Indeed, the failure of the state may be a good thing, but this will depend on how reliant we have allowed ourselves to become upon it. The idea of the center no longer being able to hold is rather disconcerting for some people. If the center collapses, what will happen next? Will all social order collapse? Will we see a repeat of the violence and looting that characterized the July 2021 riots? Will mere anarchy be loosed upon the world? Not necessarily. Here we have a choice. Power abhors a vacuum, and what replaces the state is essentially up to us. It can either be alternative forms of order, or it can be organized criminal syndicates that fill the void that is left by the collapsing state. The first and most obvious way to stop the decay is at the ballot box. Vote out the rascals who caused the problems in the first place. The Free Market Foundation is a non-partisan organization, and I should stress that. We don't support a particular political party, but we do support freedom. Recently, reform-minded opposition parties coalesced around a common cause to dislodge the ANC from power. We at the FMF were greatly encouraged to see the so-called multi-party charter expressly committing itself to freedom, non-racialism, and an open market economy as part of its founding values. Parties that expressly support freedom deserve your vote, but it remains to be seen whether the multi-party charter delivers on the rhetoric. We've also been, we also have to be realistic about the electoral arithmetic. While the ANC has been taking a hiding in the polls, it is probable, if not likely, that the party hangs on to its electoral majority. And as the ANC's electoral prospects diminish, it will continue to push redistributionist policies that satisfy its voting base at the expense of hardworking taxpayers like yourselves. Expect to see more populism from the ANC as its power begins to wane. Calls for a basic income grant, national health insurance, and pressures on the independence of the Reserve Bank will continue to grow in the run-up to next year's election. To the business men and women in the audience, I fear that backroom lobbying and social compacting will not dislodge the government from its current trajectory. So beware and plan accordingly. My advice is to support reformist political parties, but also to hold their feet to the fire. We shouldn't expect electoral politics to be a panacea for the wide range of social and economic problems facing the country. While a change in power will certainly be welcomed, the sheer scale of the damage that has been wrought 
will require more than simply electing new office bearers. Regardless of the outcome at next year's general election, you should be prepared for more volatility and a continued decline in state capacity in the years to come. One of the major fallacies of post-1994 South Africa is the notion that policies are good, but implementation is bad. The reality is that bad implementation is actually what protects society and the economy from even worse policies. <laughs> Had implementation been good, we would be further along the path to where Venezuela and Zimbabwe are today. We would own nothing and we would be very unhappy. But this is not a good situation to be in, where incompetence is what saves us from ruin. We want the ineffectiveness of bad policy to be a built-in feature of the system rather than a bug. That is, in many respects, what a strong federalist system is. Unsurprisingly, the ANC and the EFF are against federalism. We've known this for a long time. But when considering the prospects of federal decentralization in South Africa's future, in particular after the 2024 general election, we need to cast a critical eye to the reform-minded opposition parties. Some opposition parties claim to be federalist, but this is not really the case. The Democratic Alliance has only recently begun truly pushing for devolution, but devolution is not federalism. We believe the DA and any other party that governs a municipality or province must stop asking for permission from Pretoria and do what the Constitution empowers them to do. With any luck, Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal will, will from next year be governed by opposition coalitions, which would be the first time in modern South African history that the opposition governs more than one province. This has the potential to shake things up significantly, establishing a block of provinces that support one another in taking more and more power away from the center. So what I've just discussed is the realm of electoral po politics and constitutional reform. But now I'd like to talk about the role of privatization and deregulation. In the more day-to-day -day area of economic policy, the FMF has long championed a job seekers exemption certificate, or J6, to allow the unemployed, the millions of unemployed that I mentioned earlier, to exempt themselves from the laws and regulations that keep them in a permanent state of joblessness. Privatization, that dirty word, is also very close to our hearts. Transnet, SAA, ESCOM, the water boards, take your pick. It should all be privatized. And there are many ways to do this, which I will not dwell upon. But the key is that the government and politicians must not try to do that which the market necessarily does better. Government might subsidize here and there, but ultimately when it comes to the provision of a good or service, be it education, electricity, healthcare, or even roads, the private sector will always perform better. What I've been talking about thus far is all within the realm of formal politics, voting at the ballot box, implementing a more federalized constitutional dispensation, deregulating the labor market, and privatizing state functions. These are all things that some level of government cooperation will be necessary for. The Free Market Foundation does engage actively in this domain. For example, by recently launching, together with the Fraser Institute in Canada, the Economic Freedom of the World Annual Report, which outlines how economic freedom and the government reforms that are necessary for it produces prosperity. But, like so many others, we at the FMF have lost confidence in the political elite, whether opposition or incumbents, engaging in such a process in a sincere way. Reform is not the only pathway here. Increasingly, individuals, communities and businesses should look away from the formal political process and look inward and towards one another. The best answer to state failure that we think has thus far been provided is the concept of state proofing, as the business group Sarkilicha encourages its members to do. State proofing is an approach that recognizes the state for what it truly is and not what it claims to be. What does state proofing look like in practice? Number one, avoid taxes as far as you possibly and legally can. The state is essentially a rent-seeking machine 
which has shown itself as incapable of holding, upholding its mandate to collect and spend money fairly and judiciously. Lowering your tax exposure can be done through offshoring your business. And if you have the means to do so, acquiring a second passport or residency in another jurisdiction. Mauritius, for example, has a double taxation agreement with South Africa, and many South African businesses are incorporated there. You should seek the right legal and tax advice to lower your exposure while staying within the bounds of the law, of course. And please, we implore you, do not provide voluntary financial assistance to government institutions. If you considered leaving a large sum of money to your alma mater state university when you pass away, please reconsider and look to the emerging private colleges. If there is another pandemic and government sets up another fund to pool money in, please rather consider supporting a private alternative. Help build resilient institutions outside of the tumultuous political arena. Number two, the second step for state proofing. Big businesses should stop supporting the government. The recent partnership initiative between big business and government is a way for the government to reinforce its policy agenda. It effectively amounts to indirectly supporting the ANC on the eve of an election. If you are a business leader and you feel it is necessary to provide support where your interests are being directly affected, you should demand significant concessions and reforms first. Business leaders have so far been very timid in terms of their demands, amounting to essentially unconditional support. Instead, business leaders should follow the example of Raymond Ackerman, who passed away on 6th September, age 92. He was one of the few in business to stand up to the state during the apartheid era. For his illustrious contribution to South Africa, Mr. Ackerman received the seventh FMF Luminary Award in 2014. Business leaders should follow Mr. Ackerman's good example. He did not let politics silence him or co-opt his good name. Number three, support civil society organizations that are creating alternatives to unbridled statism in South Africa. The Roman poet Juvenal once wrote, case custodiet ipsos custodes. In English, who will watch the watchman? As I wrote in December, 2022, quote, a constitutional state is one where power is necessarily decentralized. However, power should not only be decentralized within and throughout the different spheres of government. In a constitutional state, social formations like professional associations, trade unions, religious organizations, and community groups all carry with them a measure of political power in a broad sense. These formations serve as a coordination mechanism for citizens, allowing them to act as a counterweight to government power. Organizations such as Sakelicha, the FMF, the IRR, Solidarity, AfriForum, Outer, and Gift of the Givers, as well as dozens of others, all play an essential role in upholding the constitutional state. They operate often on limited budgets and could use your support. Number four, roll up your sleeves. The sad reality is that most middle-class South Africans experience double taxation. Not only are they coerced into supporting public health care, education, and police, and get nothing in return, but they also have to provide their own medical aid, send their children to private schools, and hire private security guards to protect their homes and businesses. While this is a lamentable drain on resources, it is no good whining over the proverbial bry about why your local municipality has not fixed the growing number of potholes on your street. Why not fix the potholes yourself? I know a gentleman who works for a large financial services firm who spends his Saturday mornings filling potholes with his friends in his northern Johannesburg suburb. I also know a mining lawyer, who I shan't name, who spends his nights patrolling mines armed with an automatic rifle. He is literally putting his life on the line to protect his industry and his way of life. To be a viable and sustainable solution, these initiatives need to be scaled. Private companies like Discovery are also filling potholes and providing firefighting services even. We need more companies to do similar activities. Number five, shift your mindset. Above all, the best way to stay proof is psychological. This entails changing your attitude and your pre preconceived assumptions about the role and the nature of government. The first mindset shift is to realize that government 
and politics is not the best answer to whatever problem you might be faced with. When confronted with a seemingly intractable social or economic problem, your first port of call must always be to ask what individuals, voluntary communities and businesses can do before defaulting to the idea of approaching the state. We are too used to outsourcing our problems to somebody else. Instead, we should narrow the locus of control to the local and the particular. Living in a truly free society entails taking personal, communal and commercial responsibility for the greatest number of things. The state was never meant to be responsible for everything, like we think it is today, and hence the state is predictably failing. Sometimes, letting the problem simmer is a better approach than asking the state to solve it. The state, after all, is not neutral. It is made up of a variety of groups with overlapping and competing interests. It is seldom, if ever, attuned to the so-called public good. Number six, avoid defeatism. We do not find ourselves, thankfully, in a totalitarian state. The very harmful South African government is not an all-powerful institution. The majority of South Africans treat it with the contempt it richly deserves. While we in the suburbs were cowering in our houses with our masks in 2020 and 2021, most South Africans were out and about keeping the economy going. The harms of the government can be mitigated and eventually eliminated if we mentally take the state off the pedestal we put it on. We are governed by our inferiors. All the power they have is the power we perceive them to have. It is not real. However, societies in far more dire situations than we are in in South Africa today have turned the corner in recent history. The East European bloc is the best example of this. Georgia, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Hungary, and many others are all states that were absolutely ravaged by totalitarian communism for decades. When the Iron Curtain came down and these societies rejected communism, they became prosperous within a generation. Why? Because they embraced individual liberty and free markets and allowed ordinary people to take their destinies into their own hands rather than expecting some vanguard to do so on their behalf. One can also think of the so-called communist China and Vietnam today. These communist states have in fact adopted a plethora of market-based reforms that have led to a significant improvement in socioeconomic conditions. Remember that only a few decades ago, China experienced a cultural revolution and a great leap forward, which led to the deaths of hundreds of millions due to communist misplanning. Today, it is an economic powerhouse. Don't succumb to disaster porn. There is no point of no return. Things can get better, and they can get better quickly. People who are defeatist do not say no. They say whatever. I worry that we are starting to say whatever in South Africa, and that defeatism will end up being the death of us. Let's rather adopt the power of no, with smiles on our faces, optimistic about the future where we can all prosper. The Marxist political theorist Antonio Gramsci wrote from a prison in fascist Italy in the 1920s that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. South Africa finds itself in such an interregnum. Our political class has failed. And there is no shortage of morbid symptoms all around us. However, out of the ashes of this crisis, we have the opportunity to choose something better, more durable. This will entail radically decentralizing decision-making and empowering everyday South Africans to set their own course in life. The center cannot hold. Thank goodness. <laughs>